No matter the month, no matter the time, even March Madness, SEC football talk should never cease, and it never does here on SEC Breakdown. This is our eighth edition with the crew. This is it. This is the team right here. we got Chad Neveling, we've got David Waters, Mike Laval, and myself, Mark Rogers, talking SEC football. We previewed and gave you a sneak peek at spring practice Eastern Division last week. We're going to do the same with the SEC Western Division squads getting after it on the practice field, most of them just in the past uh, five to ten days and, and getting started here very soon. We'll see those spring games mid to late April. So, Chad, let's start at the top. They are the national champions once again, the Alabama Crimson Tide. And, wow, quarterback gone, running back gone, those two studs back at wide receiver. The defense has been ravaged by some losses to the NFL, but, of course, the talent's all over the place. Yeah, I don't think it's, uh, you know, there, there's going to be any issue there. I don't know. Uh, it's going to be a third year in a row for, for Kiffin to have a, a new starting quarterback uh, for him. So he's proven he could do it the two years prior. Let's see what he does. Uh, this year it looks like it's going to be redshirt sophomore uh, Blake Barnett, who's most likely going to be looked at to be the starter. You know, the passing offense, it, it did okay last year. It was ranked number five in the SEC, which is better than the, the lower half at 227 yards per game, 3,400 yards plus total um, in passing last year. So I think it, it's going to be a matter of, of trying to reload and, and identify some, some early candidates and leaders in certain positions early on on the offense, specifically at quarterback and running back. Uh, running back after the loss of Henry and Drake. So you're looking for not just one, but two guys to step up. Damian Harris, uh, Bo Scarborough are going to be the leaders in the in the doghouse coming out. And you're going to look at freshman Josh Jacobs and B.J. Emmons will be in as well. So those are Emmons, whichever way you want to say it, um, will be, uh, be looked at maybe to contribute early on as well. You know, the run game, one of the best, man. Third in the SEC behind LSU and, and Tennessee at 2,900 yards almost might as well call it 3,000 uh, 4.6 yards per carry and they about 199 yards per game 33 touchdowns this last season on the ground second in the SEC in touchdowns you know running wise um, you know some areas that you really want to keep an eye on with this Alabama team in transition is specifically with the defensive coaching staff that's been revamped you're gonna have to take a look at that and kind of how that's going to affect Mel Tucker leaves goes defense coordinator Kirby Smart Georgia uh, so you also got uh, you know four down linemen that you you're, you're losing those two guys you know four guys you saw a lot of rotation two of those guys will probably be first round picks in the NFL draft coming up uh, then you turn around you lose a starting safety and your linebacker as well who's possibly going to be another first round draft pick so the D line to me is really going to be interesting and of course the secondary like I said with Mel Tucker leaving coach Ansley's coming in from Kentucky may not seem like a big hire but this guy was a grad assistant there at Alabama between 2010 and 2011. Um, you know, and he helped Kentucky's defense uh, reach a school record six uh, six defensive touchdowns this last season. So you also want to look at him as a guy that can fill in pretty quick. Um, again, 23 turnovers in 2015. That was second in the SEC. You wouldn't have thought that about a school like Kentucky, but he was able to do it. So interested to see those storylines and how they progress uh, through this spring going into the fall. I think that Alabama front seven, and specifically the front four, was maybe the most devastating unit we've seen in recent years in college football. And you mentioned the loss of Jaron Reed, Sean Robinson, the two big stalwarts at tackle, gone on the offensive side. Yeah, third straight year. So Blake Sims, Jacob Coker going at it a couple of years ago. Sims inexplicably, unexpectedly wins the job. Coker comes back. Pulls in a fine season, very pedestrian-type season until late and really showed that he could uh, throw the football and open it up against uh, two really good teams to win the college football playoff. Uh, interesting to see. We think of Alabama running game because of the offensive line. It doesn't matter who the back is, but, of course, they've had the transition from Ingram to Richardson to Yeldon to Henry. So is Bo Scarborough or... Damien Harris, either one of those guys, up to the challenge of carrying the mail when it really counts down the stretch in the SEC. Blake Barnett, probably the most talented with the highest ceiling of the quarterback competitors, David. So your thoughts about Bama? I think you hit the nail on the head when you, you know, we're talking about Brett Scarborough coming in. It was, you know, he's kind of been the running back, you know, coming in as a freshman that hasn't jumped on the scene like past Alabama running backs did. But that's just because, you know, Derrick Henry was so dominant and they just let him take over games. 
Uh, I'm going to harp on what Chad said. I want to. I'm willing. I'm ready to see what's going to change on the defensive side of the ball. We know that's Nick Saban's defense, but Kirby Smart was there for so long. You know what happens now when you lose that much talent? You're and you're switching defensive coordinators for the first time since I think 2008. That's how long Kirby Smart had been there. So you know what happens when you? And we've mentioned the names: Cyrus Jones, Reggie Ragman, Jaron Reed, Ashawn Robinson. I mean, it could have been much worse too. But Jonathan Allen. Uh, Tim Williams, Ruben Foster, uh, they put off the draft. They came back. So he's got plenty to uh, – they brought in Jeremy Pruitt, and we've seen what he's done with FSU and Georgia uh, lately. But uh, it's going to be – there's a lot of changeover. And it was – the secondary was a big problem until they brought Mel Tucker in the last two years. Uh, Alabama had a propensity to give the big play up a lot, and he really helped shore that up. And Kirby Smart thought enough of him to take him with him to be his defensive coordinator at Georgia. So, you know, it's it's weird to say that Alabama could have a problem on defense. I won't necessarily call it a problem, but it will it's it's a different scenario than what we've seen these defense uh have to deal with going into uh this spring. And if they can find the right trigger man, the the offense could be prolific in addition to the running game with our Darius Stewart, Calvin Ridley, and look at O.J. Howard. The numbers weren't there in the regular season, and then look what he did in the college football playoff against Michigan State and specifically against Clemson. Wow, this guy is a talent and a nightmare of a mismatch uh, for secondaries. Uh, Mike, your thoughts about the Crimson Tide going to practice uh, last week? Yeah, Mark. I think you make up. I think you bring up a great point with OJ Howard. Just like David mentioned, the three key guys on defense who chose to come back instead of leaving the draft early, OJ Howard did as well. And I think when you see a first-year starting quarterback, probably Barnett, possibly Bateman, OJ Howard is really going to help them out. In addition to uh, the receivers coming back, he was woefully underutilized in the regular season last year. Had a breakout performance in the college football playoffs, but in the SEC, where you have these tremendous defensive line defensive lines and these very fast uh, secondary, that tight end is a, is a key position. Uh, we saw that in Arkansas last year. Uh, we've seen it in the East a couple times. So I think O.J. Howard is going to be the key to a successful transition to another first-year starting quarterback. I think Bo Scarborough is going to be the guy at running back. Uh, Alabama has historically had multiple running backs, just like uh, Chad said, but they've also used their, their workhorse a lot. Scarborough is in that mold, uh, short, very muscular, uh, just a bruising running back. I agree with David. I think the secondary is going to be better, and <clears throat> I think it's going to be good for Alabama because if you look at probably the team coming back, uh, one of the two teams with the biggest threat, Ole Miss, uh, their strength is going to be Chad Kelly and, and his passing. So I think that secondary getting getting right at the right time, I think it was a great hire, uh, the coach to replace Tucker in the secondary. I think that really helps them against probably their toughest opponent, Ole Miss. Of course, their other toughest opponent, I think, is going to be LSU with Fournette and that depleted defensive line is going to be tested in that game. Uh, so, so I agree with you guys. I'm really interested to see how well they replenish the defensive line, but I think their secondary is going to be as good or better than last year. That's going to help them out against Ole Miss. Hey, Mike, let's uh, go top to bottom and stay with you and go with the Rebels since uh, you've already started to talk about Chad Kelly coming off a 4,000 passing season. I think the key here is that they lose four offensive linemen if course the stud Laramie Tunsil but uh, four total offensive linemen from the starting five is difficult to replace especially for a team that hasn't mounted the type of running game that uh, is usually equals SEC championship but hey if they don't blow the fourth and 25 against Hunter Henry and Alex Collins uh, they're in the championship game last year. Right you mentioned they're, they're losing uh, pretty much 80 percent of their offensive line to include Tunsil and Cooper uh, that's going to be huge uh, they and don't forget they're losing two of their top three receivers in Treadwell and Core. Uh, so who's going to be back other than Chad Kelly? We don't really know in the offense. Uh, who's who's going to play running back? Jordan Wilkins uh, or, or Akeem Judd? Neither one of which is is bringing a uh, top name back uh, to the backfield. So it looks like it's going to be Chad Kelly's team uh, to carry at least on the offense. And of course uh, they're losing uh, losing some talent on the defense as well. It's going to be interesting to see. I think Ole Miss is going to be a little bit overrated coming into the season because of the return of Chad Kelly. Uh, I don't think people are going to appreciate the amount of loss of, of the offensive line, the receivers, and then the defensive line talent as well. Uh, I think Ole Miss might be uh, set up for a, uh, for a disappointing season next year. And the great part is we'll, we'll probably know uh, on the first game when they travel to Orlando to play Florida State 
the good news for Ole Miss is they don't play another October. Pulls that out, they'll have a chance to to regroup in, in Oxford uh, to include uh, a home game against Alabama. Yes, I applaud the Ole Miss football program for scheduling a meaningful game. Florida State Ole Miss, I can't wait to see that one. Florida State uh, or Ole Miss not playing anyone uh, Power 5 uh, this past season. Yeah, when these handicappers look at these teams, too much uh, uh, attention given to the quarterback. Let's see who's back on the offensive and defensive fronts. Let's start there uh, when we start to handicap some of these teams. And for Ole Miss up front, offensively difficult. Uh, David, your thoughts about the Rebels who beat Bama again for a second consecutive season and besides a wild play could have been in that SEC championship game. Yeah, you mentioned, you know, they beat Bama, but then, you know, two weeks later they go and get blasted by Florida and also lose to Memphis. So it's, you know, they kind of take the the character of their quarterback. Uh, and, you know, Chad Kelly, while he did show, you know, you know highlights and stuff, he, to me he still kind of reminded me of Bo Wallace in a way. We didn't know what kind of quarterback we were getting week in and week out. So I think this brings another chance for him to get some continuity going. But that might be tough, as we talked about with these, you know, them having to replace offensive linemen. And, you know, Larry Tunsil is gone. And, but then you're know, counting on a, a freshman coming in. Maybe, you know, does he come in? Do you want to have to count on another freshman uh, to, you know, to be, to anchor your uh, left side of your line? Uh, that's, you know, asking, that's asking a lot uh, to, you know, for another two freshmen to come in and take, uh, take on these SEC defensive lines. And it's, uh, I kind of agree, I, I, I don't, I get the Ole Miss height just because it is the quarterback coming back, but I can also see where they can fall flat on their face, you know, replacing Laquan Treadwell, their best receiver. Their offensive line is in, you know, going to be in shambles for a little while until they get some continuity going in the spring. But they also have to, um, uh, you know, the Kandichi brothers on the defensive side of the ball and replacing some uh, defensive backs. But you know they've started practice a little bit. We've kind of heard uh, what the, what they're doing in the in the backfield. They're kind of been impressed with some freshmen, um, uh, redshirt freshman Miles Hartsfield. Uh, Hugh Freeze seems, seems high, on, high on him. Uh, also mentioned redshirt freshman Montreal Custis and Alex Givens uh, as a, an offensive tackle, as another young guy and another Jalen Julius. So these, these these young guys that Ole Miss, you know, they've been recruiting well. They're getting them to come in in the spring getting their feet wet, and Hugh Freeze seems high on these guys. So, you know, they, they do have Florida State coming up. So they got to get on track pretty fast. Yes, Mike kind of alluded to, this is the one team in the SEC that's kind of bucked the trend, even though they haven't made it to Atlanta, in being a top-level team that's been like bottom three or four in the SEC in rushing, have not mounted a big rushing attack, not a big back uh, in the backfield. They've done it slinging the ball all over the field and with a defense that just – brings DNs, and the secondary has been phenomenal the last few years. So, Chad, what do you think about the Rebels? Yeah, if I'm looking at the Rebels. I'm kind of going to go off of what David said a little bit, and the fact that the secondary, it's good to see that the young guys are showing up in spring because you've got a lot to make up for there when you lose two of your key seniors, Trey Elston, and, of course, you know Hilton being gone as well. Um, that's a secondary that struggled last year. It was number 13 in the SEC in passing defense. Um, but yet turn around and they have one of the best passing offenses in the country. Um, and that's just kind of the ebb and flow that you saw. A lot of injuries uh, that affected them at times on the defensive side of the ball. But I think Tony Connor, C.J. Hampton, you know, uh, Zedric Woods, you know, would be another great addition if they can get those guys in and get them healthy and get them ready for the fall. That secondary, like you were talking about before, the youth showing up, the guys that they've recruited previously, you know, you've got guys on campus. There's some depth there. There's a lot more depth. I know at times Ole Miss will, um, you know, they'll substitute in 20, 30 guys on defense. You know, they just keep rotating these guys in consistently. Um at any given time, so they're always keeping guys fresh. This last year, you saw a lot of struggles with injury, and of course, you talk about the offensive line. You know, and let's not forget about Cooper. You turn around, you lose Ben Steele, you lose Aaron Morris, um, along with Tunsil, who could be the number one overall draft pick coming up. Uh, Greg Little, who is a big-time five-star freshman, uh, coming in is going to be looked in to fill the shoes of Tunsil pretty quickly. Um, that's going to be a lot of pressure on him, but they, you know, he does have the ability, has the capability there. I don't think Hugh Free. And, the, and his staff would put this kid in that position if they didn't think he had the capability of doing it. Um, you turn around and you got Javon Patterson and you got Jordan 
Jordan Sims. Those two guys are going to need to fill in right away at the guard position at the offensive line. Sean Rawlings is another guy you'll want to look at. You'll get him at the you know at the right tackle. He filled in uh, for Fawn when Fawn had to move to left tackle. So um, I think that you know the Ole Miss offensive front will be set. It's just a matter of you know, can they make the replacements to get to that number one passing offense? And look, if you want to win and you want to get to the championship game and you're coming out of the West, you've got to have defense. We've seen it out of Alabama, number one defense in rushing, um, you know, in the nation. They were they were they could stop you. So um, that's what Ole Miss is going to have to get in place. They're going to have to get a defense that can stop some people and not give up the points and definitely not give up the games late uh, like you've seen a couple times with Ole Miss in 2015. So since we're staying with the top to bottom, we're actually going to go Arkansas. Tigers, Razorbacks, both 5-3 and three in the division. And despite the two ugly out-of-conference losses from the Hogs from, uh, against Texas Tech and against Toledo, we break the tie because Arkansas won the head-to-head matchup. So Brandon Allen, i, I got to give it up for this guy because took his knocks early in his career, shoulder injury, played through it, uh, much criticism, really finished off with two stellar seasons, especially his TD to interception ratio, very efficient passer, finishing off for the Hogs with a bowl victory against Kansas State. They lose Alex Collins, new defensive coordinator. I give a ton of respect to Dave Aranda coming in uh, from Wisconsin, where always produced run stuffers at D-tackle, excellent linebackers, excellent safeties. I think he's going to find more talent at Arkansas on the corners and at the defensive end positions, rushing the passer from the edge. So uh, your thoughts, Chad, on the Hogs coming into a spring practice? Uh, you know, Rob Smith has done a really good job there uh, defensively, and they're going to be really stacked on that defensive front with a lot of depth. And you add in five stars uh, coming in, making their commitments as well. McTelvin Aguim, uh, you know, one of the Under Armour uh, players that you saw this last year in All American game, another All American Under Armour guy. You know, you got Dev Whaley coming in, one of the top five running backs uh, to come in. So that's going to help ease a little bit. But he's a freshman; he will get there to the summer. You're going to have to look at him pretty early on, much like you did with Alex Collins a couple years ago. But Alex Collins, three years straight, had, had over a thousand yards rushing. Uh, he joined some very elite company in doing so. Um, not only that, you turn around and you look at the fact that they are stacked at tight end. They bring Jeremy Sprinkle back, who's another athletic, rangy guy. Um, he can block. He's really deceptive at times. He's really good at getting open in, in zone defenses. So he's a guy that you know you could toss it to over the top. Um, and I like him. I like it. There's a Again, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of depth at that tight end position, including Greg, uh, his little brother, who's actually playing in the Buffalo Bills right now, plays for the Buffalo Bills in the pros. Um, he's there on campus. So you've got you've got a lot of talent built up at that tight end position. Not only that, you've got a wide receiver core that is is really stacked this year. And if they can stay healthy, that's going to be big. Yeah, Cornero. Cornelius Reed, uh, you turn around, he, you know, Hatcher's coming back for another season. Uh, so you got some talent there for whoever the quarterback is. Uh, the key is is really going to be the, at the running back position, who's going to step up and be your starter there because we don't know if Raleigh Williams is going to be back until this fall uh, due to his injury that he suffered this season. Um, and if that's the case, then you're going to really have to lean on a freshman. Then you've got Cody uh, Beast Mode Walker back there as well. Big, big guy, 6'2", 250. Uh, could put a hat on you and move the move the pile if he needs to. Offensive line, there's going to be some transition, but you get big Dan Skipper back going back to that left tackle position, a guy who's 6'10", a, a real 6'10", not this fabricated. We're going to give him a couple inches on the roster here. Uh, he's a big boy, so you got him out there on your – you know taking care of your blind side. So I think Austin Allen's probably going to be the guy. He's the leader in the locker room. He's the leader um, and outspoken. This guy is really tough. If you'd have seen any tape of him in high school, you'd know that this guy can take a beating and keep on. Um, and he's just – he's a guy. He's much like his brother. Um, and he can roll out and he can make the plays with his feet if he needs to. But you got to credit Dan Enos and what he was able to do from Central Michigan coming down, being an offensive coordinator – and making this passing offense one of the better passing offenses in the SEC this last year um, with Brandon Allen at the helm. It's that big of a difference. Danny Enos, being a former quarterback at Michigan State himself, made a big impact on Brandon Allen. Defensively, linebacker, you got to get somebody to show up, and that secondary has got all the talent in the world. Transition of a new coach, we'll see how that works out, but uh, you got a really good one, former Iowa State head coach. Uh, Jennings leaving to go to Texas, so this is going to be an interesting transition, but Arkansas, 
Uh, if not for them being in the West, you could really look at them and say, man, they've got a real good shot, but the West is just so deep. Even with teams rebuilding, um, it's still going to be tough for them to get to that SEC championship game. Chad, being a true professional, took me off the hook with the Aranda comment because I had uh, LSU listed as the second team I was going to talk about and have us set up, so I had him on the brain and started talking about uh, his uh, defense uh, coming down. I'll have the same comments to say about him transitioning <laughs> to Wisconsin personnel to LSU personnel. He's going to have DNs. He's going to have corners that can play. So I'll, I'll just fill it in right there. So, David, we got the Hogs who lost to Toledo, lost to Texas Tech. Then they turned it around and played much better. It looked like it was going to be one of those the rails are coming off type of seasons uh, before they even stepped into the SEC West. And then they took care of the business for the most part, going five and three, tying for second place. And, yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to jump on Chad's bandwagon there. I think a lot of credit goes to Dan Enos and, and Brett Bielema for, you know, bringing him in. And, you know, I think noticing that that ground and pound – you can't you can't rely so much on that in the SEC. So Bielema, I think, was smart enough to go and get a, a guy who could come in and, and open up that you know open up that offense just a little bit. Uh, I think the worry still is just a little bit on defense, but they do have nine guys coming back, uh, so that's that's huge. So they got the experience there. They just need that experience to come around a little bit. They gave up 27.4 games, you know, uh, 27.4 points last year. Uh, um, so there's plenty of room to improve. But, you know, I think a lot of that improvement has to come in the secondary. You know, it was the they – were, they were second in the league in rushing. So, you know, you got to fix that back in. And Chad said there's plenty of talent there. They've got they've got the guys and they've got the right personnel and they've got the right coaches. But, you know, what do they need – and Chad can probably speak to this more, but what, what what's the difference to, to bring the pass defense up along with our rush defense? Hey, Mike, yeah. uh, unless you want to jump in, Chad. No, I was just going to say, I think a lot of it, too, you can't overlook with that secondary. You can't overlook the de facto uh, elephant in the room, and that was their linebacking position. They had defensive ends trans, you know, playing linebacking positions because they didn't have enough personnel due to injuries. And when your linebackers um, are really great at making the rush, like you saw with the defensive stats that David pulled out, um, you know, it's easy to do that, but whenever you're getting thrown over the top or you're trying to keep up with an athlete like an O.J. Howard coming over the top, it's really hard when you don't have the guys in place personnel-wise. They haven't recruited there very well the last couple of years, so I think that's going to be a, an area of emphasis because they actually have three legitimate linebackers, guys who played linebacker in high school coming in to play linebacker this year, so hopefully that's something they can shore up, but you're right, David. I mean, they've got to. The passing defense was atrocious for Arkansas. Hey, Mike, uh, you break down the coaching position about as well as anyone I know, and Brett Bielema looked a little over his head. Uh. <laughs> Mark, are you still there? So hey, hey Dave and Chad, I'll just uh, I'll just I think I know where Mark was going. Uh, yeah. You know I think what Bielema is going to look for in spring practice, I think what's going to be most important from a coaching aspect is to find that Dave, depth. Uh, let's... Is to find that depth and consistency. Uh, mm -hmm. Mark talked about the losses to Toledo and Texas Tech. Then you look at the games against Ole Miss and Tennessee, where Arkansas looked really good. Uh, they, they finished very strong with a nice bowl win against Kansas State. So I think what Bielema and the coaching staff are really going to have to find is depth and consistency. Chad talked about the linebacking woes on defense for the last couple of years. That speaks to the depth. Uh, Dave, you're right. They're returning 9 of 11 starters. I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to see uh, how that defense, if they're able to turn the tide this year. And we look at consistency. You know, We talked about it. They lost Brennan Allen, Hunter Henry, who I think was their most valuable player last year. I think that tight end position is so key in the SEC because it creates so many matchup uh, troubles for the defense. They lost Alex Collins and the three offensive linemen. So I think when Bielema looks at the coaching for this spring, he's really going to focus on consistency and depth, which I mean every coach does, but it's going to be critical for Arkansas. That you know, I see Arkansas kind of like uh, uh, South Carolina in the East or maybe Kentucky. They're a team with a ton of talent uh, that has the chance to win the division. They just can't seem to get over that, that middle division hump into the, into the uh, uh, competition to win the division. They're a lot like Tennessee. They've been on the hype train for the last couple of years. 
if they're not able to get up to eight or nine wins this year, uh, you might see some people start uh, coming off the Arkansas bandwagon. So I really think uh, Mark depth and consistency is what Bielema is going to be looking for uh, from a coaching staff perspective this spring. Mike, talk about a program that's kind of met Arkansas at the same level, but coming from the other direction is LSU competing for national championships, but in the last few years they've dropped off. I don't know that there's a team in the SEC that comes back with more continuity at quarterback, running back, and the two wideouts with Dupree and Doral than LSU. They seem to be set up for a big year. If Brandon Harris and Cam Cameron can work together and, and figure out, this was a team that had, I believe, uh, other than South Carolina and Kentucky, the fewest uh, big passing plays of 20-plus yards than anybody in the conference. And with Doral and Dupree on the outside, that shouldn't be the case. No, no it shouldn't. And, and you hit the nail on the head. Uh, Leonard Fournette's going to get all the hype at LSU, but, uh, look, that team's only going to go as far as Brandon Harris can take him. Uh, they, they brought in uh, a couple guys. You, you got Danny Ashley coming back and Justin McMillan, the transfer. But reading the reading the uh, reports out of New Orleans uh, and, and Baton Rouge, it looks like it's going to be Brandon Harris's team again this year. Look, Brandon Harris doesn't have to be the guy in Baton Rouge. He, you know, he he's looking for that uh, that Jake Coker, that uh, Blake Sims, that Trent Dilfer model. They just need him to be a game manager. Uh, get four or five passes to the tight end, 10 to 15 yards a game, and get eight to 10 targets down to Malachi Dupree deep and let Leonard Fournette do the rest. So I think if Brandon Harris can have a solid season, LSU is going to be back in the national title contention. It's going to be all about Brandon Harris. They come back with eight starters uh, on the defense. Their only question marks the linebacking core. Uh, stop me if you heard this before. LSU has a defensive coordinating change, bringing in Dave Aranda from Wisconsin, which you talked about earlier, and then and then uh, questions at quarterback. That's really the narrative of the entire conference, particularly the West this year. But again, if Brandon Harris can get consistency and manage the game, LSU will be in the national title hunt, I think. And again, they're another team that starts off week one against Wisconsin and Lambeau. So we'll find out if Brandon Harris is ready from the very first game. Mike, you stole my segue there. I'm looking forward to that game. They played a really good game at uh, Reliance Stadium in Houston two years ago. Melvin Gordon was having his way. Wisconsin was up 24-7. He left the game. The Tigers started to use their playmakers on the outside, hit a couple big plays, and the defense took over, won a really good game, 28-24, I believe. Uh, but, yeah, at Lambeau, you talk about a college football setting, week one, LSU-Wisconsin, that's going to be great. All right, Dave, uh, talk about the Tigers. What, what do you see there? I think it's going to be interesting how Aranda comes in, and with the depth concerns at linebacker, he's been known to come in and, and change his style. He, he can run a 3-4. He's run a 3-3-5 before. LSU's typically ran a 4-3, but what you know can, does he come in and run multiples because of the depth concerns they have at linebacker? Kendall Beckwith you know, comes back, and that was huge for, huge for them. They didn't lose a lot of talent, but there wasn't a lot of talent at linebacker to begin with, and that's weird to say about LSU just because <laughs> we've known that defense just to be you know, one of the SEC's best, but it's you know they're making their third change in, in three years, and you know it's, it's, it, I, it's hard to put my finger on L, the LSU team. I, <clears throat> I, it's, I, I'm not sold on them as much as everybody else is, and, I, and, I, and I'm not sure if it's what happened with the last mile situation last year. I think that's another mental thing going into this spring is, you know, yes, they rallied the troops and, you know, sent him out the right way and, you know, the whole firing thing, if was that going to happen, and it's just, Again, with the coaching changes with, on the defensive side of the ball again, what, what's the status of this team with Les Miles? You know, what happens if they lose the first game of, uh, of the first game of the year again, and or lose a game they're not supposed to, or get beat by Alabama again? Does those rumors come back up? Of are they tired of Les Miles? So, I think you know, getting through, getting tougher mentally about you know coaching changes and all that is a whole is another aspect they could hit the spring with. I have no problem with coaches that are paid to the extent of Mark Richt and Les Miles being held to a standard and then being let go. Now, you better be able to replace them with somebody who's better, uh, but I have no, no issue with, you know, we're not talking about firing the middle manager at uh, Kmart. We're talking about top-level elite coaches who are being paid 
prime money to win championships. So if they can't get it done, I have no issue with those those moves when they're made. And that was my call on Les Miles and Mark Richt at the time. Uh, Chad, your thoughts about LSU trying to keep up with Bama in the West? Yeah, this is the thing. You would think with you know this being the season that it is, they get Ole Miss, they get Alabama at home, a bye week in between. Their road schedule is kind of manageable. Um, you know, for the most part, they go to A and M there towards the end of the year. Um, but it, it's somewhat manageable for them. It is going to be a task, I think, a little bit at the linebacking mm-hmm. position, kind of going off what David said there a little bit in the fact that, you know, yeah, you get back with, but outside of him, is there anybody that's really all that special? You're going to look for some guys to step up. Uh, Michael Divinity, who was an early enrollee, is a guy that you're going to look at who very well could be in a starting position. Um, senior Corey Thompson's another guy that you, you may look at. He's typically been a safety, but he also could be that hybrid uh, type of back and, and linebacker safety type guy. Um, you want to turn around and you want to look at the fact that uh, incoming freshman, highly touted running back Devin White, Apparently, they're trying him out at the linebacking position. That's what uh, the word is on the street. So that'll be kind of interesting. That's how much they want to address that position. So I think um, that's going to be the big thing is getting the guys in place, finding out who their playmakers are going to be at that position and work on educating them and making sure that they've got a pretty solid you know, starting front and then go from there to see if they can get anything in the two deep. But um, that linebacking position could be problematic for them, especially considering that their defense was that you know passing – anyways was uh, wasn't that great man I mean their passing defense was uh, one of the lower it's been in, in quite some time uh, I believe they're at LSU as a matter of fact at number 12 in the SEC they finished they gave up 224 yards and that was uh, you know for the longest time people wanted to say it was DBUs between them and Florida so I think you kind of tip the hat towards Florida with that uh, with that stat but anyways the, the passing the thing is on offense and this is basically it might kind of hit on it bottom line the relationship between offensive coordinator Cam Cameron and Brandon Harris, the quarterback, has got to mature during this spring. You've got to be able to see some big steps going forward. Brandon Harris just has been really timid when it comes to throwing the long ball. Um, you know, guys that I've talked to that have been covering the beat, a lot of them say it's just because he has some issues with trying to learn the offensive scheme at times. He's a great pure athlete, but he struggles with the, the aspect of learning the game and his football IQ. So that being said, I feel like, you know, Cam Cameron and him really got to be able to make sure that their relationship is key uh, going into the spring and making sure that the communication is there so that he can help Brandon Harris mature more as a quarterback and be able to see those deep routes open up because, uh, you know, like Mike had said earlier, if you can't get that passing attack going, you're going to have some issues. When your passing offense ranks number 11 in the SEC, but yet you have the number four total offense, that tells you a whole heck of a lot about what this team is doing offensively. That being said, it's tough to stop a guy like Fournette. Then you got Geis coming in who showed last year on special teams and at times when he got to carry that he was a really special talent. Um, so I think you've got some guys there in the running portion. It's going to be a matter of can you stop us and you bring back Le Couture for his senior year at the defensive line, so that's going to help out a little bit. But, you know, there's a lot of questions here for LSU, and if they're going to do it, it all starts at that quarterback position. Yeah, and to stay on that theme, Chad, uh, the reason Brandon Harris couldn't get on the field the season before was exactly what you alluded to. He had difficulty absorbing the playbook. They gave him one start on the Plains at Auburn, and it was a complete disaster against a marginal Auburn defense, and they had to get him off the field because Anthony Jennings at least could run the offense and understood it, even though Harris had the bigger upside. They were able, obviously, to work with him enough in the offseason to get him set to where he could be manageable in the offense but really couldn't take the passing game to the next level regardless of having those elite receivers on the outside. So let's stay at quarterback but switch programs, Chad. Mississippi Mm -hmm. State, Dak Prescott, nobody wouldn't confuse him with the best player in the conference, but considering position, maybe he's the biggest loss for any team in the SEC Mm -hmm. coming into 2016. Yeah, I think if you're going to look at, you know, as you alluded to there as your last statement, 
I mean, if you want to look at impact of a loss for a team, you got to look at Dak Prescott and Mississippi State. It's going to be huge. That being said, I, I will say this. I've seen Fitzgerald in person. I've been to some of you know, I got to cover their spring uh, a couple seasons ago when he was a freshman. This kid's the real deal, man. He's got all of the – you know, the immeasurables that you want out of a quarterback. I mean, and the measurables. He's tall. He's, he's a thick, you know, guy. He's got the arm. He's got a cannon. I watched him do one 30, 40 yards on a rope, man. It was impressive as a freshman. So, um, this guy's got all the tools. It's just a matter is it is the offensive line there. Are the parts around him that he's going to need to be successful on offense there? Wide receiver, running back. Uh, the running back position was not that stellar this last year. It was mediocre to say the least. But Dak Prescott helped that because you were able to use his legs if you needed to. Um, you know, defensively, man, you know, can the – Bulldogs be tougher against the run. That's going to be your biggest issue. You lose Chris Jones, who, by the way, had probably the worst uh, wardrobe malfunction at the Underwear Olympics <laughs> in the Combine. So um, that being said, I mean, you've got to, you know, you got to look. You've got a big guy to replace. I mean, this guy's going pro. That's a lot. One of the first uh, few five-star guys that I've seen as a freshman come in and actually play as a five-star. Um, and that says a lot about him. Still, you've got seniors. you got six senior linemen that are expected to be coming back this next year. You're going to see some time. Linebacker, oh, man, it, it should be good. You're going to look at Jerry Green. It's going to be a guy, redshirt freshman. Leo Lewis is coming in. Leo Lewis was highly touted coming out of high school. Um, I can't really express how, how highly touted he was. A lot of people wanted his services coming out of high school. Uh, so that's going to be big. It's just going to be a lot of measure. You know, can this defense take a step forward? The defense is going to be leaned on a lot more, I think, this season to try to help win some games because this offense, there's going to be a lot of new pieces, a lot of new moving pieces on the offense for Mississippi State. But I do think Nick Fitzgerald is a guy that can get the job done if need be. I'm just curious about the pieces around him and how that's going to come out. So it sounds like you're penciling in Fitzgerald over Elijah Staley and Damian Williams, interestingly enough. That's a guy as a freshman that we saw uh, get into some games, uh, won a game in overtime against Arkansas and played some substantial time as Dak Prescott was just beginning taking over the job at, at that point uh, with, with Russell in the mix. Uh, the running back position, they, they need to find that guy. It was Josh Robinson a couple years ago, Ladarius Perkins before that, uh, Man, you mentioned Prescott taking over the running game, and they can't have that again this year because they don't have him where he's outrushing the top two running backs. And uh, maybe Ashton Schumper can finally live up to his potential and what we've expected of him uh, over the last few years. So, so David, the Bulldogs are a team that uh, played a soft non-conference, did pretty much what we expected them to do in the SEC at 4-4, four and four, then completely outclassed NC State uh, in the Belk Bowl. Right, and I'll go back to the running game. You know, they ranked twelfth in the SEC, and you like you mentioned, Prescott led the way, and that was with only five hundred eighty-eight yards. Uh, Holloway was the top running back with only four hundred thirteen. You know, so you're right; they got to get that position figured out, especially with whoever it is at quarterback. I probably will lean, to, lean towards Fitzgerald as well, but don't count out Damian Williams. But yeah, that, that, the offense is going to be retooled. Mullins got a track record, you know, of figuring that out, but you know, he's you know he had Tebow at Florida and Prescott at you know Mississippi State, which you know are arguably the both programs' best quarterbacks ever. So you you know does he can he can he find you know if if he has a subpar quarterback, can he still get the job done with the pieces that he has? And you know Chad said they're going to have to rely on that defense. That's true, but they I think if I'm not mistaken, they were replacing every defensive coach on that staff. It's they're bringing in an NFL linebacker uh, coach, a uh, former NFL linebacker. Peter Sermon, he's coming to Starkville. Uh, he spent some time at Southern Cal. He was the interim uh, uh, defensive coordinator there. So I don't think he has a lot of experience coming in. But, you know, the, them replacing every coordinator and assistant coach on the defensive side of the ball and all the questions they have on offense, this may be a tough season coming up for Mississippi State. Yeah, interesting story with Dan Mullen and Peter Sermon and them having no coaching ties before this and just basically having a long, long conversation and Mullen really stapling him to the wall in regards to philosophy, theory, how you coach kids, and him winning uh, the job uh, just based on a long, long, like day-long conversation with uh, Dan Mullen. Uh, Will Redman, we talk about secondaries and we throw out LSU and Florida, Georgia's in the mix, but this Mississippi State secondary has been serious over the last couple of years, but no Will Redman this year 
on that side of the ball. Benitez Brown also going to be missed. Uh, Mike, your thoughts about the Bulldogs? Yeah, I think uh, Mississippi State, you know, continuing the theme of quarterback uncertainty with defensive coaching changes. The good news for Mississippi State is uh, they, I think they got eight guys coming back on offense and eight guys coming back on defense. The bad news is the guys that aren't coming back were, were the best players, Robinson and Prescott on offense, and then some of the guys we've talked about on defense. Look, I'm a big fan of Dan Mullen. I think he is a great coach. Here's, But, but this is what he's going to face every year at Mississippi State. Mississippi State is the one team in the West that has the lowest program ceiling. Uh, I think you know, all the, the other six teams in the West can all be – a national power year in and year out if they build the program that way. Alabama's been there. Ole Miss looks like they're building a consistent winner. Um, Auburn, LSU, and AM clearly have that potential. Arkansas has had it in the past. Mississippi State's the one program that the coach there is going to have to build every year in two and three year in two and three year periods with his players. I think Mullen's going to have Mississippi State back to a bowl game. I think they're going to do better than what people think they're going to do, but they lost a lot of talent. They have a lot of guys coming back, but the guys that are coming back aren't the talent from last year. So, again, I'm a big fan of Dan Mullen. I think he's a great coach. I think he's going to, uh, he's going to be able to piece another bowl season together. But at a certain point, I think Mullen's going to get tired of doing this uh, year in and year out, the 7-5 and five, uh, Belk Bowl, Independence Bowl. He's going to get tired of that. He's, you know, he, he's going to move to a better school where he's going to be able to build a consistently uh, high-level program, which I don't think uh, is really uh, possible uh, there in Starkville. Yeah, I was covering this program uh, under Jackie Sherrill in the mid-'90s, and that was the ceiling. Peach Bowl and the, the, the type of bowl games that you just uh, mentioned, uh, going 7-5, and 8-4 and four every year, and that was as good as it got. Then there were some drop-downs, obviously, Sylvester Croom and some other coaches that came in and didn't do so well. So let's stay with you, Mike, and let's go to the bottom of the SEC Western Division, which in any other conference, as we've talked about many times in college football, <laughs> Texas A&M may compete for a division championship. But many questions, and if any school is trending a particular way that is not difficult to find the trend, it's Texas A&M with the loss as a quarterback, the issues with someone, and, and uh, what, what apparently is a problem in, in keeping talent at that position, and now they're down to bringing in Trevor Knight from Oklahoma, Jake Hubenex, a, a third string guy that we saw uh, playing, you know, he wasn't even in the competition with Kyler Murray, Murray and Kyle Allen, but was pressed into action in the bowl game. Certainly not up to the challenge, but played well in the fourth quarter to get them within striking distance. So Texas A&M, a team that, again, someone comes in, top five recruiting classes, they're riding the wave, they're stockpiling defensive talent to try to catch up with the offense. But suddenly, here in the last year and a half, it seems to be headed the other way, possibly. Yeah, Mark, I think uh, clearly Kevin Sumlin comes into this season as the coach uh, that's most on the hot seat in the SEC after that debacle at the end of the season last year with his top two quarterbacks. Uh, the good news is they got the, probably the best wide receiving core in the SEC coming back, Ricky Seals Jones and Josh Reynolds. Trevor Knight coming in. Uh, let's hope the curse of Katy Perry was broken when he transferred uh, out of Oklahoma into College Station. Uh, oh, and, Additionally, Texas A&M is going to lose three offensive linemen, and their running game uh, really needs to develop in the spring if they're going to be able to protect uh, whoever is back there taking the snap uh, in the backfield. But here's here's what you should look at most. Uh, the big hire last year was John Chavis on the defensive side. He's got tons of talent. Are they going to be able to translate the, the Chavis hire and the talent on defense into results? They haven't been able – they did not do that last year. They haven't been able to turn talent into results in previous years on defense. They still have Miles Garrett, but here's what's going to hurt Miles Garrett. They lose their two interior linemen, Oahu and Williams. And so I, offensive, offensive lines are going to be able to focus a little bit more on Miles Garrett to kind of contain him. They do return eight starters on defense, but those two interior linemen are really going to hurt Miles Garrett's effectiveness. So, again, uh, uh, quarterback questions and uh, translating the talent and the defensive coordinator into results on the field is really what's going to tell the tale with Texas A&M. It's going to determine whether or not Kevin Sumlin stays there or if he moves on. 
All right, David, again, uh, Texas A&M with Kevin Sumlin, the sheet guy. We don't know how much Johnny Manziel had an effect on recruiting, but those classes were stacked early on, not so much this past year, and they took over the state of Texas in regards to recruiting, but the Longhorns got quite a bit of that back with a nice class this past season. So where do you see the Aggies headed? I mean, not only Manziel did he help recruiting, he probably helped Kevin Sumlin more than anyone because – program hasn't been the same since Menzel left, and, you know, how much can someone attribute his success to Johnny Manziel? Uh, and to help with that, he brought in uh, uh, Mel Mazzoni, for, uh, offensive coordinator from UCLA, which I think is a great hire. Uh, that it, it's the right kind of hire to help turn this around. I'm not saying it's going to, because I, I, there's, I think there's a toxic, a toxic situation going on there. When you have that many players leaving in at the quarterback position, that's, there's something very toxic going on there. But I think Mazzoni is a great hire. Him and Summon have a background together. Uh, they've kind of coached the same type of offense. They're gonna, still going to go fast-paced. Uh, you're not going to see that change, but you'll see some of the philosophy from Mazzoni change. I think it's a great hire. And uh, But I'll jump on back to what Mike was saying about the defense. Uh, Chavis was a great hire as as well. He, you know, he, his resume speaks for itself. But against the run is where Texas a and really struggled last year. And in their five losses, they gave up an average of 270 rushing yards. And in the SEC, that's not going to get it done with as much as these teams like to run and to, you know smash the ball. So you know, can can Dalen Mack comes back? He's going to be somebody who can fill in that defensive tackle position that will help. But uh, you know, I think the defense, the defensive tackle, and getting the running game figured out, and let Mazzoni come in and help with the uh, quarterback position, whether it be Trevor Knight or uh, Jake Hubenock. So, uh, you know, it's how short is the leash with someone? You know, if it falls apart fast, we'll, you know what happens there. And and I think it's going to be a very very interesting spring to get this fixed fast. Yeah, I believe Texas A&M starts out with another marquee game. Last year was Arizona State. They were able to win that one against uh, what we thought was a top 15 team that lost seven games. And uh, this year is going to be UCLA for Texas A&M at Kyle Field. Should be an interesting one against uh, Mr. Josh Rosen and company. So, Chad, your thoughts about uh, A&M? Yeah, I think A&M is really an interesting story. And, you know, when I go on the radio or I do, you know, some interview or something, they, you know, that's one of the things is asked is, you know who's got the hot seat in the SEC, and one of the first places he looks in College Station. It's just uh, you know with the debacle last year in the passing attack, um, that wasn't what we've seen prior uh, with with Kevin Sumlin. I think a lot of questions started to surface. Some finger pointing by fans, media writers, things of that nature. Uh, a lot of that landed on Dave Christensen, and uh, he was the line coach for them. And I think that was wrongfully done. But you turn around now, and they. You know, they've got some guys in place. I think that this offense, uh, Mazzoni being there, a lot of what I'm hearing from guys that are reporting there is that it's a lot about speed and tempo this year. They're trying to get back to that 2012-2013 seasons uh, where it was a lot about speed and they came in and they just kind of blew guys away um, in the SEC because they weren't expecting that. And that's what someone wants to get back to. This last year, if you look at them rushing-wise, they're actually their rush game improved by about 20 yards uh, from about 149 to about 167, 168, somewhere in that range. Um, so that, you know, it did improve. But like you pointed out previously, their pass, you know, their rushing defense was, it's still uh, one of the worst in the SEC this last year. Not the worst, but one of the worst. Um, but where they did excel at in the area where, you know, off, you know defense coordinator chief uh, Chavis is, is a specialty is in the secondary. And you look at their secondary, their passing attack actually was pretty good this last year. And if I'm not mistaken, I think they actually finished, I want to say they finished in the top five in passing defense um, at number two. That's right behind Georgia so in 2015 so they actually improved quite a bit in that department um, it's just up front you've got Mac coming back you got two bookends coming back um, you're just going to need a couple more guys on that interior to step up along with Mac and I think you could actually have something going there on the defensive side of the ball again it's the offense and you know Trevor Knight yes he can do some things with this play you know, with his feet, but can he catch on to this offensive scheme set quick enough and go with the tempo that Mazon's going to come in with because he is probably going to typically go with the single back type of offense. They're going to try to utilize a lot of the tight end position, and they're going to put guys out there in the, you know, in, in I guess in a lot of like X pattern stuff so they could get guys going 
early on. They're going to dink and dunk when they have to, but they're going to really try to use speed and tempo with this offense. So I look for that to be key for A&M uh, coming out of the spring and Hopefully we'll find out who the quarterback is going to be. Um, Hubenak does have an opportunity. He did play in the bowl this last year versus Louisville. Um, but that being said, I think he's kind of a middle-of-the-road quarterback. And I think Knight, if he, again, if he can catch on quick enough, uh, he'll be the guy that will be starting for uh, A&M in the fall. All right, those Auburn Tigers, 6-6 six and six with the bowl victory over Memphis to win at game number seven. Gus Melzahn. The shine is off at this point. Uh, Jeremy Johnson was supposed to be the answer going into last season. He was lost. We talked about Brandon Harris being lost. Uh, Jeremy Johnson uh, did not have a grasp of that offense. Sean White, a guy that can really throw it from the pocket, had a little help once he entered the game. Chad, John Franklin, uh, th this kid, uh, the third from uh, Florida State, it, it appears as though he might be in the mix as well. But it's uh, it starts at quarterback for Auburn. Yeah, I think so too. And it, you know, it's a wide open uh, quarterback battle that we're going to see this spring. Uh, Malzahn has talked about that. Uh, John Franklin the third. Yeah, he looks to be the guy. He spent his freshman year at Florida State went JUCO route afterwards. Um, you know, didn't want to ride the pine there, and now he's coming in from the JUCO route. So you got experience a little bit. You think he's he's possibly going to be a guy that's going to battle Jeremy Johnson. Yeah, last year he got the starting job. He wasn't what everybody thought he was going to be. White comes in. Um, did okay, fought some injury, played in the Birmingham Bowl, still wasn't a real, you know, real spectacular finish from Alzon. Um, the seat is hot. You want to be out in the plains right now, your, your bottom side's real hot right now. I think if, you know, with the addition of Kevin Steele coming in as defensive coordinator, Muschamp did leave him a lot of tools to work with. You're talking about Carl Lawson, Matravius Adams coming back, Byron Cowart, who's a five-star the year before. You got several ESPN 300 recruits that are going to be on there. So, I mean, the defensive line should be pretty solid for Auburn, Auburn this next year. But... Where they have to get better is as an entire unit and in that passing defense. They were number 13 in total defense this last year. Gave up 405 yards per game, guys. That's just astronomical to me that you were even in the SEC and gave up that type of yardage. So um, you turn around, they've got to get better. Kevin Steele, uh, for what it's worth, he's been around the league a little bit. He did finish LSU with 2015 defensive rank number five total defense, 310 yards per game. Um, but that being said, it's still a lot to overcome, I think. So you're going to have to really, really watch this defense and how they progress. Quarterback position, again, I said it's it's wide open. The number 12 passing offense this last year, they only averaged 173 yards passing per game. Let that marinate for a second. Under 200 yards passing, and it was an SEC offense. That's just, for me, that's mind-boggling. So you turn around 12 interceptions, 11 touchdowns, one of four schools that had more interceptions than touchdowns passing this year. The other three, Kentucky, Vanderbilt, Missouri. Let that sink in for a minute. So those are kind of some issues that, that Auburn's facing. It doesn't look good for Malzahn. Matter of fact, Malzahn had went out in the offseason to get a new defensive coordinator before hiring Kevin Steele and tried to get Shoup, who is now at Tennessee. Uh, he offered to fly up to actually interview with Shoup in State College, and Shoup said no. That's how bad that he didn't want to go down there. So in my opinion, Auburn right now, uh, for what it's worth, it, it's a dumpster fire in some aspects, and Malzahn's seat is extremely hot. Everybody wants to love and coddle this guy, but I think that's over with now. Um, so now you've got to figure out what's going to happen on offense and who can show up in the run. They need that dynamic playmaker at the quarterback position to make this offense work. So I'm really curious to see with some of the additions at wide receiver that they have coming in, also at linebacker and defense, defensive line, can Malzahn get this thing together coming out of the spring? A lot of questions about this team going into the fall season. Yeah, when you think Auburn under Malzahn, you think offense. Devastating running game, Cameron Artis Payne. Uh, Nick Marshall running the controls, and the offense was anemic last year. The the stat rundown you just gave us, Chad, uh, the one that stood out to me that, that I was actually going to throw out there, yeah, single-digit touchdown passes. Sean White played substantial time last year and threw one touchdown pass. They lose Ricardo Lewis at wide receiver. Obviously, Sammy Coates has been gone for a couple of years. Duke Williams, they don't have those kind of players that are proven 
They have the guys coming in. They had a really good wide receiver crop that you alluded to coming in, but they're going to have unproven guys that they're going to have to pin, depend on to be dynamic playmakers on the outside. Javon Robinson, an interesting back who's got big play potential, but the defense for once may have to be Auburn's uh, bell cow if they want to win big in the SEC and, and do much better than two and six uh, is what the finish was last year, David. Right, and it was a defense that got better under Will Muschamp, and then they really showed out on the you know in the bowl game against Memphis, where it was kind of a surprise shutting down Paxton Lynch like they did. But you're right, they bring back Carl Lawson, Montrevious Adams, Byron Coward. Byron Coward was a little bit of a disappointment as a freshman last year coming in. There were flashes, uh, and that, but you know you were listening to some of the insiders at Auburn there, and it was just he's and if you followed his Twitter account, there were times he was just seemed really not happy at Auburn. Uh, will a change of uh, you know coaching staff and on the defensive side of the ball help him? Uh, we'll see there. But uh, but they also uh, you know that linebacker core is going to be really good too. While they lose a couple guys, I like the talent behind them in Trey Williams, Deshaun Davis, and Jeff Holland. I really like Jeff Holland. I got to see him play a lot here in Jacksonville from Trinity Christian, and, and he comes from a high school with plenty of talent. He's going to Auburn, where I think he'll shine. Oh, uh, if I have a chance to shine this year. Uh, if you read some uh, spring practice reports, they've started practice already. It is Jeremy Johnson taking the first team reps right now, and it's not even close. Uh, but you know, it's still early. You, you probably that's probably a little bit of expected. If him or Sean White, I you know John Franklin, I think he'll get every chance. You know, if he comes in, you will probably see a little bit more of that Nick Marshall type of offense. Uh, for Auburn and, and running the ball a bit more. But, yeah, who is going to be the running back that helps with you know, either Javon Robinson, uh, Rock Thomas, or Carrion Johnson? But they also have to replace their starting offensive tackles in Sean Coleman and Avery Young. I really – I was a big Avery Young fan. But, you know, with the quarterback uncertainty, not really knowing who the running back is, uh, and wide receivers, they Auburn has a lot of questions on the offensive side of the ball. Yeah, things have gone south rather quickly after making it to the BCS National Championship game in 2013, Mike, for uh, Gus Malzahn. Yeah, Mark, I, I'm in a complete agreement with Chad. I've talked to several Auburn uh, fans and supporters over the past couple of days to include some insiders, and there's and not a lot of people who are very happy uh, with Gus Malzahn, it seems, there at Auburn. I'll add on to what Chad said about the shoot higher defensive or the, the, the lack of interest from shoot. A lot of Auburn insiders are really upset about how DeMunion Craig was, was treated and then his departure over to LSU. A, a lot of the guys who follow the Auburn program really thought Craig's departure over LSU was a harbinger of the future to come, and they saw that as kind of uh, a bellwether of, of how the coaching um, uh, uh, coaches are getting along there at Auburn. Uh, there's there's quite a bit out there about uh, Muschamp not being happy as defensive coordinator. I do agree with Chad. I, I think that there's a lot of talent there on defense. I think Howard's going to be great. Um, I think Kevin Steele is a proven defensive coordinator at LSU. I think that's uh, they're going to have to rely on that, and I think it's going to be the focus. One of the two focuses of spring practice is Steele getting those guys in his system and getting them uh, to 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 run that defensive system, because they're going to have to rely on that. Uh, like Dave uh, said, Jeremy Johnson's taking the snaps. Uh, I, I think before we go into fall camp, I think it's going to be between Jeremy Johnson and John Franklin III, just because of uh, just because that's Malzahn's way. And I think he's I think he is attached to his system, and he wants one of those two guys. But a lot of question marks surrounding Gus Malzahn. I agree with Chad. I, I think he's on the hot seat, not quite as much as Kevin Sumlin, but another 2016 year, like 2015. And uh, I think the guys, uh, guys and gals at Auburn are probably going to be tired of Gus Malzahn. He's one of those guys that's been kind of a two- and three-year gig in all the places he's been, Tulsa, Arkansas State, Auburn the first time, uh, and then Auburn the second time. So this is a big year for Gus, Gus Malzahn, the coach. Uh, we'll find out again. We'll find out pretty quick as Auburn hosts Clemson at Jordan-Hare first week of the season. Uh, so we're going to find out just how good that Auburn defense is. And uh, just like David was talking about with Sumlin, you know, if Auburn gets blown out week one against Clemson at Jordan-Hare, which is a possibility, things might go south quick uh, there on the Plains. And, and 2016 has the possibility to be even worse than 2015. All right. You have found SEC Breakdown, and we have found a home on Wednesday.